Hi, today I'm going to read you a story from Sisters in Pieces that is in several different voices, and so I'll do my best to let you know. If you actually read it in the book, it's in different typeset. That helps. So here we go. Sleep tight, George Orwell. John Smith closed his eyes and tried to control his thoughts. We aren't supposed to know his real name, Marcus Black Knight. If you want to tell the story, keep identity secret. That's what he said the night he told us when we were all settled, ready for the long sleep. The entire table, all 12 men, had lapsed into silence following, following Jason Crinole's announcement. Everyone knows Crinole's name now that he's been executed and all that for treason, and so we're safe using it in the story. Marcus John Smith was the oldest man there. He often wondered why they kept him on, these young men with ideas that made him squirm with discomfort. He limited his, his protestations, but they didn't know that. They saw him as a roadblock, and he suspected they were waiting for him to leave the group. Death was the only thing that would make him leave the group. 1984. It had been so far in the future when Marcus John Smith first read the book, and now the time of the expected Big Brother takeover had come and gone, so that the story was an ancient tale, something young people had never heard. If you mentioned Big Brother, they gazed at you with those eyes that said, Senile. To survive, it is often necessary to fight, and to fight, you have to dirty yourself. George Orwell's own words. As a young man, Marcus John Smith had made that his motto, his creed, his mission statement. Why did age change things? Okay, we admit it. It's an awkward way to tell a story. But we don't have much time. And so we can't go back and change the tense and all that, even though half of us wanted to. And we have the technology to do this, John Baker asked. Not his real name either, but we can't have two John Smiths. That would be really confusing. Of course, Crinole answered. We've had it for years, waiting for the need. If you turn to page 27, you'll see this is step 14. Marcus, okay, we need to save time, and you already know his name, so that's what we're going to use from now on. Anyway... Marcus listened to the swish of ten men turning to page 27. He left his syllabus closed. No need to look. He had memorized the whole damn document yesterday. The plan wasn't really complex, not if you thought about it. Phase one, develop personal computers, but keep them high in price so only educated people have access. Gradually introduce models which more people can afford. Give them away to schools and establish the machines as replacement for current items, encyclopedias, news articles, skill acquisition programs, so that teachers and students will be dependent on the computers. Introduce the web and make communication tempting. Seduce young people into displaying personal information. Introduce a scare or two, call them viruses, something people are already programmed to fear. Come up with an answer and people will insist on daily scans, the perfect disguise for downloading all the information they have already so eagerly typed into their machines each day. Oh, make that uploading. Make computer, computers portable, personal, colorful, and popular. Increase access for the really poor through schools and libraries. Phase one of the plan had gone forward without a hitch. It's really hard for us to imagine a world before computers. Even though Marcus has some pictures, the old kind, on paper, and he showed them to us. Surely the computer was just out of view in those pictures, those old photos, and he just wasn't showing it to us. Phase two, cell phones. Same idea. Start off expensive to increase the desirability through that disgusting human trait, greed. 
the haves and the have-nots use youth to make a true impression. If the other kids have one, so must I. Mommy, Daddy, get me one now. And now Cronol had explained how they would move to phase three. Personal phones, as tasty as candy, as fun as toys, as pretty as a bouquet of flowers. We call them little sister. I never understood until Marcus explained about the big brother is watching you thing. Marcus thought of another quote. Funny how things stuck in his mind after all these years. Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. You would be proud, George Orwell, Marcus thought, or distressed, because your book was, was a satire, not an instruction manual. No one needed to implant chips into citizens to track their actions, to see where they were at all times, to know how they spend their money. No, we just handed them a pretty toy and told them to carry it with them wherever they went, use it for mail, for maps, for banking, for photos, for recording, for calendars. Put in every single piece of personal information on that pretty toy. And so the citizens complied with the thought police. Dave studied the new phone Callie had given him last week. For three days he had tried to figure out this thing. Smartphone, dumb man. He couldn't keep the mantra out of his brain. Why is it asking me for my current location? What's it using it for? To drop a bomb on me? Tell it yes. Callie was unpacking groceries. She'd forced Dave to sit at the kitchen table and learn to use his phone, offering to help him after a week had passed and he made no effort. Why? Because then I can use my phone and see where you are. What if I want to have an affair? My phone is going to wrap me out? How smart is that? If you're going to have an affair, leave your phone at home. And while you're at it, don't come back. Callie shook her head at him. It uses the information for all kinds of things. Maps, photos, weather. If you lose your phone, then we can find it. Tilting the phone so that Callie couldn't see what he was doing, Dave tapped, don't allow. Maybe he wanted to lose his phone. As the ten men nodded, asked a few questions, and flipped to page 38, Marcus studied the young faces. Cronall had them convinced. It was Marcus's job to argue, to bring up issues so that the young man would question things a little. Pure strategy, of course. Later on, when these men thought about the meeting, they would feel like their ideas had been used, like they were important in the matter. How could the manipulators be so blind as to not see how they were being manipulated? Marcus knew he was being manipulated, too. Cronall knew things Marcus wasn't privy to. Secrets held by men so invisible they didn't even know each other. But Marcus knew what Cronall didn't, that the manipulation started long before either of them were born. Long before George Orwell was born, for that matter. Wade Black Knight, grandfather of Marcus, had told him stories. Before computer and cell phone technology, there were utilities. So important to people. What a treat after living in dim lights of candles and lanterns, hauling water from wells and creeks, walking through cold and rain to use a spider-filled outside outhouse. In the beginning, people were allowed to check their bills. Rich people were, that was, because phones and electric lights and toilets were only offered to those with plenty of money. But the same tricks worked a hundred years ago. Start off with the rich, and gradually the rest of, let the rest of the folks in on the treat. If one only made three phone calls per month, it wasn't hard to check that you'd been billed correctly. No taxes or fees, just a per minute charge. Then came the fees. Grandfather had laughed when he told Marcus about the drunken nights spent thinking up names for the fees. Names so official and technical that no normal man would question their presence. Access tax, line-up tariff, modulation charge, CA45698 fee. 
Soon, meter boxes, toll calls, long distance, and other such complex issues were introduced. Now, John Normal, we're running out of ideas for fictitious names, give us a break, had more trouble knowing if his bill was accurate. And if he called to discuss it, why, he was put on hold on his own dime. Marcus was sure Grandfather Black Knight had never imagined that the day would come when people would let the utility company take money straight out of their bank accounts, never even bothering to check the charges. Automatic bill pay. Even the name was wonderful. Marcus had explained to us the idea of writing out a note on a paper each month which acted as money. Checks, they were called. We couldn't understand why people would take up so much of their valuable time to make sure they were paying the correct amount. What would they do about it if it was wrong? Jenny Foster finally went into the actual branch of her bank. She had to drive out of her way, practically to downtown Oakland, the only place there was still a branch and not just an ATM. I'm not sure what happened. It says I'm overdrawn, and I really shouldn't be. Nothing has changed since last month. All my expenses should be the same. Jenny held up her phone and scrolled through her statement. Well, let's take a look. The smiling teller, one of only two humans in the main branch, the other was an armed security guard, scrolled through her monitor. The first thing to check is the amounts on your auto bills. You wouldn't believe how many errors can slip in. On the automatic bills? What kind of errors? Jenny never checked her automatic payments. Wasn't that the point of automatic? The teller tapped her way through the screen. Oh, here's one difference. It looks like your information access company, One World, One Line, right? It, it looks like they raised the monthly charge. They did? The teller smiled. <laughs> yes, I noticed mine went up last month. Look, here's another. Your heat and sewer charges took a jump. Jenny drove home without stopping to shop as she had planned. She would have to take a serious look at her budget. If everything had gone up as much as the bank teller told her, her salary would no longer cover her expenses. Marcus was tired and he skipped our bedtime story. What's wrong, we asked. Nothing, I'm just getting old. Does everyone have your little sister? He held up his phone. We held up ours. She'll tell you a story tonight. Tuck her under your pillow. We snuggled under our blankets and tucked little sister under our pillows. Marcus trudged into his cube and sat down on the edge of his bed. He held the phone in his hand and looked at the new blue light. Cronol's introduction of phase six was too much for him to comprehend. How could technology get right into his head now? He had understood it when the world imagined an implant, usually just behind your ear, connected to your brain by some physical technique. But with radio waves? Only they weren't called radio waves. Some newer version of Marcus's ideas. Cosmic transporters. He almost smiled as he remembered the early Star Trek series. He rolled his eyes up toward heaven. Was God still up there? Beam me up, Scotty, Marcus said as he tucked his phone under his pillow and lay down to sleep. Thank you.